medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. In the previous video, we talked about the efficacy of the vaccines against the Delta variant. But there's been a lot of questions about whether or not natural immunity is sufficient for the Delta variant. If you've had COVID-19 in the past, does that natural immunity protect you from getting COVID-19 in the future? And does the Delta variant change the equation on that? Let's talk about what the data shows. So for a great real world example, we turn to this paper that has not been peer reviewed or published yet, but it was a study involving over 50,000 subjects at the Cleveland Clinic. On December 16th, what the Cleveland Clinic was able to do based on their subjects, 52,238, was they were able to determine that 2,579 of them before the campaign of vaccination started were already infected with SARS-CoV-2 and that 49,659 were not infected with SARS-CoV-2. Then what they did was they tracked them over the next five months and they saw those that were vaccinated and those that were not vaccinated. And the question was, in a comparison, specifically looking very carefully at those that were infected and not vaccinated, so in other words, these people here, how did they do in comparison to those that were infected but vaccinated? In other words, was there a difference in the incidence of new COVID-19 between these two groups? So what we're seeing here on the x-axis is five months of time. So 30 days times five months is 150 days. And it starts here at time zero when they began vaccinations. And as you can see here, all of the groups, except for one, had no accumulation of incidence of COVID-19 in the not previously infected vaccinated group, in the previously infected but unvaccinated group, and in the previously infected vaccinated group. However, there was one group that did accumulate COVID-19 infections as time went on, and that was the not previously infected and unvaccinated group, as seen here on the y-axis, which is basically showing what percent of the cohort became positive. You have 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, and of course, that's growing with time. So in other words, by 30 days in, 3% of the not previously infected and unvaccinated group had turned positive for COVID-19. Now that's in contradistinction to the previously infected but unvaccinated group. They behaved very similarly to the vaccinated group, indicating that previous infection was just as good in real-world data as being vaccinated. And I just want to stress again that this data was collected before the Delta variant. Another interesting article appeared in JAMA titled Associations of Vaccination and of Prior Infection with Positive PCR Test Results for SARS-CoV-2 in Airline Passengers Arriving in Qatar. So what they did was they initiated a program looking at passengers arriving at Hamad International Airport, and they actually had about 261,000 subjects in the study, so it was a big study. And what they did was they divided into three groups. The first group was those that were vaccinated and could show documentation of vaccination. There was 31,190 subjects in that group. Then the other group was those that were not vaccinated, but had evidence of previously being infected. And that was 9,180. And then they looked at the group that was not vaccinated and did not have a past history of infection. And that one was 215,901. And then they looked at the positivity rate. Yes, they had everybody take a SARS-CoV-2 test for positivity to see whether or not they were positive. And if you were to look at this in just some round numbers, the positivity rate on the vaccinated group was 0.82%. And that's not surprising that it would be that low because these people were all vaccinated. However, when you looked at those that were not vaccinated and had not had a history of infection, their infectivity rate was about 3.8%. 
So the question is, is what would these people who were previously infected look like even though they had no evidence of vaccination? Would it be closer to these people here that were not vaccinated and never infected or closer to these people who were previously infected? In other words, were they getting a benefit from having a previous infection in reducing their rate of testing positive at the airport? And the answer to that was the positivity rate was about 1.0. So very close to the 0.82 and further away from the 3.8. Again, lending credence to the idea that previous natural infection to SARS-CoV-2 gives you some immunity against being reinfected. Again, strength of this study shows in the size and the number of subjects in the study. And the one drawback of this study in terms of predicting outcomes in a Delta variant world is that this data was collected between February 18th and April 26, 2021, before the Delta variant was an issue. Another great release of study is this from the United Kingdom's government titled New National Surveillance of Possible COVID-19 Reinfection, published by Public Health England. Subtitle is that new data suggest a low risk of COVID-19 reinfection in the population. And this was just released in June of 2021. So what they found was that there was 15,893 possible reinfections. But remember, the denominator here is out of 4 million people with confirmed cases. When they looked at it more closely for the data, that was narrowed down to about 478 probable infections and about 53 confirmed reinfections. And this, of course, led them to say the current data shows that there is a low risk of infection with SARS-CoV-2. There were 15,893 possible reinfections with SARS-CoV-2 identified up to the 30th of May 2021 in England throughout the pandemic. Out of nearly 4 million people with confirmed infections, this is equivalent to around 0.4% cases becoming reinfected. So the risk of reinfection up to this point is extremely low. So currently, we do have not only biochemical data with antibodies, but we also have real-world data in terms of the strength of natural immunity for the prevention of COVID-19. However, all of that data in terms of real-world data is cast, unfortunately, in the pre-Delta world. The question is, is what does the Delta variant do in terms of changing the paradigm that natural immunity seems to be effective in real world data? Well, enter in this paper that was published in Nature and accepted on the 29th of June, 2021, titled Reduced Sensitivity of SARS-CoV-2 Variant Delta to Antibody Neutralization. And what we're looking here again is a surrogate for immunity in terms of the antibody response. Now, it's not just any surrogate because what we're interested in here is the ability of antibodies to neutralize the spike protein. Now, we realize that there are other aspects of the immune system that is important in neutralizing a virus. As we've talked about many times here on MedCram, there is the innate immune system. But then there's also the adaptive immune system, and there are T-cells, and there are a whole host of other aspects to the immune system. So we're just looking at one aspect, but it's an important aspect because remember, notwithstanding the T-cell responses and all of the other things that are involved with what a vaccine does to the immune system, one of the main purposes of the vaccine in terms of preventing infection is to make antibodies against the virus. So measuring antibody response while a surrogate is important. So let's break down the information here. This was a cohort from Strasbourg, Germany, where they had 26 subjects that were previously infected with SARS-CoV-2, and they took their convalescent sera, which basically means they took their antibodies 12 months after the onset of symptoms. And what they did was they measured the efficacy of their ability to bind the virus and they measured it out here on this graph. Now, I looked at four different types or four different variants of the virus, the D614G, which is an older variant, the alpha, which is the UK variant, the beta, which is the South African variant, and of course, the delta variant, which we're talking about in this video. 
And how they measured efficacy was by looking at something called the ED50. Now, the ED50 is the effective dose at which the antibodies are able to neutralize 50% of the virus. And so what you want here is the average response or the average dose, which is marked here in this dark black line, you want this to be high. That means that the effective dose is quite high given the sera from the patient, which are these antibodies. And so as you can clearly see here, whereas the alpha variant or the UK variant, the effective dose from these subjects was high, for the beta and delta, it was low. Now, we're concerned about delta here and not so much beta because delta is far more infectious than the beta variant. Now, from that same cohort, they were able to take subjects again that had previously been infected with SARS-CoV-2. And in this case, they looked at the response to these subjects after one dose of a vaccine. And in this case, the cohort included nine subjects who had the AstraZeneca vaccine, one dose, nine subjects who had the Pfizer vaccine, one dose, and three subjects that had the Moderna vaccine, one dose. And you can see here what just one dose of any of those vaccines did to the effective dose in these subjects for these given variants. And in just in case you were wondering, these dotted lines is the lower limit of detection for this study. Now, in another cohort, this time in Orleans, France, they looked at the same thing, except in this time, they looked at the patients week three after the first dose of vaccination. And as you know, for Pfizer, you get your second dose three weeks later. And so essentially what they're doing is they're looking at the antibody levels right before the second dose. And here's something that's very interesting. What we're looking at here is, again, these variants, the D614G, the alpha, the beta, and the delta. And what you can see here is that after one dose of the Pfizer vaccine, we're looking at very low levels of protection for the delta variant, very low, arguably lower than the natural infection levels of antibody that you would see in the cohort that we saw here in Strasbourg, Germany. However, after the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, so now we're looking at eight weeks after vaccination or week five after the second dose, you can see that these levels have actually come up pretty substantially. They also did this similarly with the AstraZeneca vaccine, and you can see very similar pictures here. So what I'm going to do here is zoom out a little bit so you can compare the question regarding the Delta variant in terms of the surrogate marker of effective dose of antibodies from convalescent plasma. If you compare someone who has been infected with the virus in the past, this is the type of effective dose that the antibodies from that type of patient is going to have against the Delta variant, as opposed to somebody who's been previously infected and got one dose of the vaccine versus somebody who has not gotten the infection in the past and has gotten two doses of the vaccine. And so you can clearly see here that the best case scenario for those people who have had the virus in the past is to get at least one dose of the vaccine based on this data. And for those that have not been infected to get definitely two doses of the vaccine, if it's a Pfizer one in this case or AstraZeneca. Probably the worst case scenario, of course, is no vaccination and never have been infected. But just above that is just getting one dose of the vaccine based on this data. The other thing that this article showed is that monoclonal antibodies that have been commercially available for patients with severe COVID-19 but not yet requiring oxygen, for instance, banlanivimab, were not very effective against neutralizing the Delta variant. And of course, that's a problem because that was one of the tools that we had in the previous wave to help those patients that were early on in the infection but did not want to progress to hospitalization. The authors go on to say, we further show that Delta is less sensitive to sera from naturally immunized individuals. Vaccination of convalescent individuals boosted the humoral immune response well above the threshold of neutralization. These results strongly suggest that vaccination of previously infected individuals will be most likely protective against a large array of circulating viral strains, including variant Delta. 
And so because of that study that was published in Nature, there has been a call that patients who are getting the two-dose vaccination from either Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna need to make sure that they get that second dose, especially in a situation like we are in now, where the Delta variant is becoming more and more prolific. And this is the most likely reason why we are starting to see surges in COVID-19 hospitalizations in the Midwest. And for those providers on the front line, I want to remind you that we have a library of very useful videos in taking care of COVID-19 patients, whether it's learning about ventilators or relearning EKGs. I want to highlight this lung ultrasound MedCram video hosted by Dr. Joshua Jacquet, who is actually from the Cleveland Clinic and is one of our faculty here at MedCram. If you want to improve your diagnostic skills and the speed at which you come up with diagnoses in terms of COVID-19 and the lungs, probably nothing will do that faster for you than an understanding in lung ultrasound. Because CT scans are difficult to use because of the cleaning that has to happen after each patient. While the ultrasound probe has to be clean, it's much easier to do. It's much more portable. It gives you real-time information, and it can be very helpful, especially in analyzing the lung. So I invite you to brush up on your lung ultrasound, especially with the possibility of another surge here in the United States and around the world. And for more videos, visit us at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.